Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you. You can have a seat. Yeah, I know you didn't see this coming. That's why you're still here. Uh, it is an honor uh, to be here, uh, to come and speak about Jesus on a place that this man does every week is an honor, and to do it on Christmas. Is there something special about that? But I thought to start this off, uh, again, I know this is a loop. A lot of you are wrapping your head around this right now. Like, why isn't pastor up here? But uh, it's about the word. And I love what's happening over here with the family. This is a beautiful thing, and you're going to realize real quick that this message has a lot to do with what's happening here. Uh, but before we release the kids, I wanted to do something a little special. We do this with our students every year. Uh, it's one of the last things we do for the year. We did it uh, Wednesday night at hd and &E's house. We appreciate it. Appreciate them for hosting. Uh, Sunday, we did it at somebody else's house in New Caney. But it's always important, I feel like, to simply read the Christmas story in Luke. And I thought, what better way to start this whole service is reading that to our, our children. So what I want, I would like all our children, before we dismiss them to class, y'all, you guys come up here with me. So all the children, I want you to come on down here and sit down here right before we dismiss you to class. All the children, come on, guys. Yeah, uh, come on, I'm not going to bite. You have a seat. Just have a seat on the floor. I'm not going to bite, I promise, unless you're mine. Then I probably will. I love it. All the children. Because I want to tell you guys a story. The whole point of Christmas is, is about this story, right? I know. The struggle is real. Okay. All right, but I, want to sh I just want to simply share a story with you guys and to everybody in here. I think we all need to hear this and read this on Christmas because this is what it's about. So let, let, I'm going to tell you guys a story. Is that okay? I'm going to do it anyways, all right? But to tell a great story, you must have a strong beginning, an epic climax, and an inspiring finish. Well, this is not just any story. This is a story that changed everything as we know it. This is an event that changed everything, and it actually marked the beginning of our calendar, which is pretty crazy. It has a beautiful beginning, an epic climax, but there is no finish to the story. Because guess what? You guys carry on this story, right? Each and everybody in this room continues this story every day. But we have to start from the beginning. From the beginning, there was an amazing father who loved his children so much, more than existence itself. Of course, he created existence. Sadly, over time, his children left him, and he missed them so much. Not only did his children leave him, but they decided to abandon all that he had taught them. Saddened and heartbroken because the father knew that he would be, they would be lost without him, he had to watch his children continue to fall, knowing he had the key to helping them. He continued to reach out his hand, but they refused, and eventually he, he had to take a step back. And so for 400 years, his children continued to allow darkness to overtake them. And generation after generation, hope began to fade, and God was silent, and wo the world was at dismay. So it was dark. The father said to himself, there has to be another way. I long for my children's embrace. He said, I know what I have to do. I will have to give them a gift that will change the world as they know it. But this gift that will eventually take the best of me, actually all of me, but in the end, it would give them opportunity for my children to come back once again. So the story starts like this. Luke 1 says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to the Galilean village of Nazareth to a virgin engaged to be married to a man the descendant from David. His name was Joseph, and the virgin's name Mary. Upon entering, Gabriel greeted her. Good morning. You're beautiful with God's beauty. Beautiful inside and out. God be with you. She was thoroughly shaken, wondering what was behind a greeting like that. But the angel assured her, Mary, you have nothing to fear. God has, surprised, has a surprise for you. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and his name will be Jesus. He will be great. He will be called son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of the father David. He will rule Jacob's house forever, no end ever to his kingdom. Mary said to the angel, but how? I've never been with a man. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will be over you. Therefore, the child will bring to birth will be called holy son of God. 
And then God's angel spoke in a dream to Joseph. He said, Joseph, son of David, don't hesitate to get married. Mary's pregnancy is spirit conceived. God's Holy Spirit has made her pregnant. She will bring son to uh, son to birth. And she, when she does, you, Joseph, will name him Jesus. God saves because he will save his people from their sins. This would bring the prophet's early revelation to full term. Watch for this. A virgin will be pregnant and bear a son. They will name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So in that time, the king at the time, he, he heard about this, and he made him nervous because he didn't want to take any power away from himself. So he had to go and search for this Jesus because eventually he wanted to kill him because he was afraid the power would be taken from him. But listen, no man can take power from God. It's pretty incredible. Then about that time, Caesar Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the empire. This was the first census, census when Canarius was govern, governor of Syria. Everyone had to travel to his own ancestral hometown to the, be accounted for. So Joseph went from the Galilean town of Nazareth up to Bethlehem in Judah, David's son, town for the census, and a descendant of David, he had to go there. He went with Mary, his fiance, who was pregnant. While they were there, the time came from her to give birth. She gave birth to a son, her firstborn. She wrapped him in a blanket and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the inn. So all this darkness, and then just like that, Jesus appears and brings light back into the world. It's a beautiful picture. After 400 years of silence and darkness, God reveals himself in a baby. Little did the world know that this baby was the first light that would soon bring this light back. And then the story continues. There was a shepherd camping in the neighborhood. They set night watches over the sheep. Suddenly, God's angels stood among them, and God's glory blazed around them. They were terrified. The angel said, don't be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. Yes. A Savior has just been born in David's town, a Savior who is Messiah and Master. This is what you're to look for, a baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. And at once, the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises. Glory to God in heavenly heights, peace to all men and women on earth who please him. And this word continued to spread. And the life of Jesus continued to change people's lives. Because of Jesus, the ultimate gift to the world, light was brought back into the world. God restored hope to the world. Because Jesus loved his people, we are, not, we are now able to know who he is and have a relationship with him. This was the beginning of the light, and every time someone places their faith in him to this day, another light is formed. Because he loved us, we should love one another. And when we show others his love, their light will shine, and so on, and so on, and so on. Let's pray. Father, thank you for bringing light back. Thank you for being an incredible father who loves his people so much that you didn't give up on us. Thank you so much that we get to celebrate you on a daily basis and live in your presence and live with the Holy Spirit. We no longer have to do this alone. Father, we have you, and it's an incredible privilege and burden, not a burden. Lord, we love you so much, and I just pray that we would just be overwhelmed with this joy today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, guys. You guys can go to class. We love you all so much. I think it's so important for us to remember the, bas the basic principle, our idea of who Jesus is during Christmas. Because this is what it's about. I know we get wrapped up in all the, the gifts and the overwhelming needs of having to make sure everybody has the right gift and all the decorations and all this kind of stuff. But it's all about the ultimate gift that is Jesus. So I, as the kids are leaving, I want to share another story with you guys. This one's just for you. All right. Twas the fight before Christmas and all through the house. Not a creature was peaceful, not even my spouse. The bills were stirring out on our table with dread in hopes that our checkbooks would not be in the red. The children were fussing and throwing a fit when Billy came screaming and cried, I've been bit. And Mama with her skillet and I with my remote, she said, you change one more channel and I'll grab your throat. <laughs> when on TV there arose such a clatter, I sat up on the couch to see what was the matter. When what to my wondering eyes should appear, the cable was out. It was my worst fear. 
The Cowboys, the Celtics, the Raiders, the Knicks, without Sports Channel, I'd soon need a fix. And then in the midst of my grievous sorrow, I remember the times I had promised tomorrow. Not now, my children, but at some soon time, Dad will play with you and things will be fine. Now, under conviction, I looked at my wife. Where was my kindness? Why all the strife? My heart quickly softened. I now saw my task. Some love and attention was all that they had asked. I gathered my family and called them by name and told them with God's help, I'd not be the same. We'll keep Christ in Christmas and honor his plan. No more fights before Christmas. On that we will stand. My children's eyes twinkled. They squealed with delight. My wife gladly nodded. She knew I was right. It was the fight before Christmas, but God's love had come through, and just like he does, he made all things new. What an incredible story. I, lo I love the heart of this, and, and it's silly, but it's so true that we get so overwhelmed with the anxiety of all the things we have to do, all the presents we have to wrap. Uh, of course, that's stress my wife takes on because she does all the wrapping, but there's so much stress involved in this holiday that we soon forget that it is all about us being together. So I just want to talk, I don't have a, a great revelation for you this morning. I don't have uh, something that will just like light bulb go off in your head. I simply want to remind you and encourage you that this season is about us being together. It's about us being connected to the Father and realizing, that's why I said it's so, what you guys are doing and you know, coming together is all about this message. You don't even realize because it's so important. It's not about presence. It's not about the gifts. It's us simply being reunited with the Father and being connected with one another. And it's a beautiful thing. And I want to start in Acts 2.42, which is a very different place to start for a Christmas message because Jesus is not present in this moment. Of course, through his disciples. He is, but he's not physically here. This is actually after he left and went back, and then now the disciples uh, carried on the mission. But I think it's important, if we really want to understand the birth of Jesus and why it's so significant, to see the results of what had happened because of his life. Because he came to this world on mission. Even though he's a baby boy, it was still a mission. And as he grew for 33 years, he accomplished this mission. And this is what you see, the product of Jesus. It's a very familiar verse. It says, they devoted themselves. This is 242 in Acts. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who was in need. <clears throat> Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying uh, the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers and daily who were being saved. What a beautiful picture of togetherness, right? This is essentially why Jesus came and died, for people to come together, to have faith in him, to restore that relationship. And as a result, they restore relationships with one another, creating a bond that is stronger than anything that man can do. A bond that brings people together, that makes them stronger than anything ever before, uh, that only God can bring people, look around in this place, uh, there's hundreds of people in here with different backgrounds, different stories, but we're all in the same building worshiping the same God. Amen. This is what Christmas is all about. This text is a product of Jesus. We celebrate his birth because it was the beginning of hope being restored for humanity. And Acts 2.42 offers a formula that only works because of his revival to earth, his arrival to earth. The formula is... Me and him, and me and you. That's it. That's the formula, right? A key word in this passage here was devoted to. It starts off saying we were devoted. It's not a casual acceptance of his Jesus stuff. This is a sitting on the edge of your seat, hanging on to every word, and you just can't get enough type of devotion, right? And they were devoted to teaching and prayer to God, and they were devoted to one another, Edge of their seat, all in devotion. Not this, I'll see you Sundays occasionally. This is, I'm all in for you. We're in this together, right? We're going to spend eternity together. We might as well get used to one another. 
And you know what? There is one word that resides in the foundation of all Scripture, and it's the word together. If you really look at the foundation of the word, the foundation of everything that we teach and, and we learn from his word, it's together. He came so that we could be united with him together and united with one another so that we could be together. Our culture and sin has so, so mixed up about this mindset because it's all about independence. It's, we don't trust anyone. We block yourself off uh, because you might get hurt. The government is out to get us. This, this word hopeless resides in our culture. And God is saying, no, no, no. It's about being together, about coming together. So we look, this text is like a checklist. So we're going to look at, um, where's it at? John 17, 20. So we're backing up. We started, because we talked about the disciples. We're going to back up a little bit. This is right before Jesus is taken uh, captive, and he has to spend some time with dad. Right? And I love this, this prayer. He's praying. He's talking to God in this moment, knowing what was about to happen, knowing his future, knowing he's going to a cross, and he's about to be captured, and he spends some time with dad. You ever think about, what would you be praying about in that moment? What would you be saying? I mean, Lord, get me out of this situation. I don't want to do this. Well, there's a little bit of that too. But in this moment, I love this moment in verse 20. And you know, he could ask for anything. He could do anything. I mean, he's God. But this is what he's asking. He's praying for you. He says, I pray for also those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me and that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those who have given me to be with me and where I am and to see my glory and the glory you have given me because you have loved me me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I may myself may be in them. His prayer was for togetherness, that they would be together with the Father and they would be together with one another, that they would create a bond that would be much greater than anything and they could conquer so much more together, right? The church is at war too much with one another. We should come together, together and unite and be one. Just what, that's what he came for. That's what he died for. So that we can be with a father and that we can be with one another. We, we were made not just to be in a relationship with the father, but we were made for each other. Wrap your head around that. You were made for me. And I was made for you. It's crazy. When you're fighting at the dinner table tomorrow or something, think about that. Like Maybe an argument. You know what? You were made for me. I don't care what you say. Right? We were made for, one, we were made for this right here. You were made for, and I was made for you, to connect, to build, to bring hope, peace, life. Togetherness is essential for our faith to grow and a relationship to thrive. So first thing, together brings hope. So I don't know if you've ever thought about that. Actually, Josiah hit on it a while ago, and I shared this a few years ago in New Caney, and it, it just came back to me. But I think about, you know, that 400 years of silence and what the world must have looked like. And we celebrate Christmas after all of that. And he came, there's hope, we have joy, right? We love Christmas. Maybe turn it into a little something that it shouldn't be, but we still love the spirit of Christmas, and, but I think about the other end of that. I think about what God must have been going through in that. So uh, just an idea, and this is, if you're a theology major or you're deep into this, this is not in the Bible. This is Joseph's imagination, okay? So don't, don't get on to me for this. This is just my thought. So I think about God sitting in heaven or standing, whatever. He's standing there looking down at his people longing for this connection, Right, He created all these people out of love to have a, a relationship with them, and now they've turned their backs on him, and he just longs for that embrace. Right, He loves them so much, but they don't want anything to do with them. If you're a parent to a teenager, you somewhat understand this. But they long for that embrace, and they don't want anything to do with them. And he's just sitting there, I have to do something. 
And he says, you know what? I know, I know what I have to do. I, I'll look at the angels. He looks at the angels all around him, and they're worshiping. He says, who will go down there in my place and bring back this connection and this relationship? And he looks around, and it's like asking somebody to pray in a big crowd. Everybody's looking around, looking down. Nobody wants to pray. And that's kind of what I picture the angels. They're singing, and they're singing. And then all of a sudden, they get a, he gets a tap on his, his shoulder in the right hand, and there's Jesus. says, Dad, I'll go. He's like, no, 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 no. Who will go for me and represent me in such a mighty way and go down there and connect my people? And Jesus taps on his shoulder and said, Dad, let me go. He said, no, 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 this is going to be hard. Who will go in my place? And Jesus said, Dad, I would like to go. And God's like, no, you, you can't do this. This is not for you. This, this is, this is going to be a hard thing. And he looks at his angels one more time. Who will go for me and represent me? And Jesus says, Dad, Dad, let me go said, no, they will hurt you. I can't let you do this. Who will go in my place? And Jesus says, Dad, let me go. He said, no, you don't understand. They will kill you. They will kill you. You don't understand. It's going to be hard. They're going to push back on you. They're going to spit on you. They're going to tear your flesh apart. And Jesus says, it has to be me. It has to be me. And with tears in his eyes, he sends his son down, a part of who he is, and sends him down to humanity, knowing what he was gonna, what he's gonna have to go through. And he sends him down and brings hope to humanity. It breaks his heart to have to do that. Again, this is just Joseph's imagination. But to send part of himself down there knowing. Could you imagine making that decision? Could you imagine being in that place all because these people who don't deserve it, he loves them that much? Talk about hope. Yeah. So that they can be connected once, once again, so he can embrace humanity once again, so that humanity can look up and have a relationship with a God that created them once again. That, can, that togetherness brings so much hope. And you know what? The only difference between us and those before Jesus is that we can now be together with God through Jesus. We don't have to long for hope. We have it. Hope gives us endurance and perseverance that we need to push towards something bigger than ourselves. But within the equation of life, a big portion of, what is, of this is togetherness, and it's the only way. I could give you verse after verse. In fact, it's all over Scripture. It's all over Scripture, togetherness. This is why God values it so much, and that's just a few, right? It's so important for us to break down the walls of our heart and receive one another and receive him. It restores hope. It's why he came. It's why he died on the cross. John 17, we just read it a while ago. He says, I've given the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. Don't miss it. The formula of progress is not just complete with us. It's complete with all of us, us and him. Right? Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, a strain of three is not easily broken. Right? There's something about togetherness that brings strength and hope to humanity. Like uh, over a year ago, uh, Skylar was, was uh, fully pregnant with Izzy or Isabella. And uh, she decided in that process that she was going to have this baby at home. I said, do you remember what happened the first time? But anyways, she decided this. And you know what? I, I respected it and I loved it. And it ended up being one of the most beautiful moments in my life. Um, but she was fully pregnant. And all through the process, Diana, who you know, Don and Diana from the other campus, which now live in... in Good rich. Um, was a part of this church forever. But Diana's a midwife, and she was our midwife. And all through that process, I said, all right. She's asked me if I have any questions. All through the process, I'm like, nope. But you have to promise me one thing. You will be there. Right? I'm not delivering this baby. Right? You have to be there. And she laughs. But then she tells me stories of it happening. And I'm like, no. This cannot happen. All right? Anyway, so she comes and checks on her. And she was having some contractions for uh, probably a couple of days, small ones. And, of course, every little one's like, was that a real one? Was that a real one? You know how it goes. But, um, but anyways, Diana leaves, and then she 
uh, Scotty goes and takes a nap. And then right in the middle of a nap, I was fixing a chair at the point at the same time. I was just trying to distract myself. And all of a sudden I hear a big scream. I'm like that that's a contraction. All right. Open the door. I'm like, all right, now it's starting. I call Diana. Five minutes later, she has another one. I'm like, oh no. This is happening quick. Here comes panic. But listen, I'm good at several things. I'm good at, I think I'm a pretty decent pastor. I'm decent at woodworking. There's, a, there's several things I'm good at. Delivering children is not one of them, okay? So she starts going to contractions. They're getting three minutes apart. Diana's nowhere to be found, and I'm freaking out. And Nana's there, and she's freaking out. We're running around the house like chickens, and Skylar's in the middle of the house having contractions, and then we didn't know what to do. And then Cindy, our beautiful Cindy, right, she has, she has a lot of experience in this as well. She walks into the room, and everything changes. Right, because there's something about togetherness that brings hope and brings peace to a situation. And she changed the whole demeanor, right? She brought peace, calmed her down. I like to say she calmed me down. I just stopped walking as fast. <laughs> but there's something about togetherness that changes things, that brings hope, that brings uh, peace. Something else that it brings is light. Togetherness brings light. One of the, we do the, I told you we do the Christmas story with our students. And how we end that is probably one of the more beautiful things of the whole night. Uh, HD was a part of this this week, and he actually just come and hugged me and said, that was, I've been telling every about, uh, everybody about it. We did it a little bit different this year. So at the end of the story, we started with one person who had their, everybody has a candle, and it was lit. All right, and we turn off all the lights through the story. And as soon as I talk about Jesus being born, we light one candle in the room, right? So now we can see a little bit in the room. And then one person starts, lights their candle, and they go up to somebody else, lights their candle, and they tell them how much they love them. And then throughout the night, the whole room starts getting brighter and brighter and brighter as everybody expresses their love for one another. And it's such a beautiful moment. And, what, and I've seen grown men crying over one another, telling how to love, because no masculine, no whatever thing that we, gets in the way sometimes of, of what's really going on can conquer this, this spirit of togetherness and love that he came for. And it was a symbolic view of every, every time we did that, more light would come in the room. The more we love one another, the more we brace, the more light we bring into this world. Right? The more pushback, the more division we cause takes away from the light. The more we embrace one another in love, the more light we bring in the world. And it was a symbolic view, and it was a beautiful picture of what God has done. Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on, a, on its stand and gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You have an incredible gift to be light. Incredible gift. When he entered the world in a manger, he instantly brought light. That is your gift. Don't hold it back. You're going to be giving gifts away this season, but make, must, make no mistake, you are the gift that people need. There's nothing you can physically, physically give them that will ever be better than giving of yourself. Yesterday, I had this beautiful moment with my dad. My dad's a hero, my hero, right? And uh, I've been blessed. I ha have two motorcycles, very blessed. Um, I have a 2000 Harley Dew Softail that somebody blessed me with. And for the longest time, I just saw my dad on that bike. And so this Christmas, I thought, you know what? Finally, I'm going to do this. And I wrapped up the title and the key, and I gave it to him. And I never saw my dad cry until last night, and he opened that. And it wasn't about the gift. It's about what it means, this honor and this love. And it was such a beautiful moment. And then we didn't need motorcycles or any of that kind of stuff. It was about people coming together, showing each other how much we love one another by being present. It was an amazing moment. We have this phrase in our student ministry, I say it all the time, that this is not our burden, this is our privilege. Right? We have the reminder cells from sometimes working with teenagers that this is not our burden, this is our privilege. Or ministry, but I take that to with people. People are not our burden. They are our privilege. We get to love one another. We get to have opportunity to have a relationship with. Right? It is a privilege. 
It's an opportunity. When I was a child, many of you probably did this. Again, my dad, my hero, my dad's a cop as well. Uh, he was HPD for 20 something years, retired there now, he's in Leon County. But when I was a kid, I remember sneaking into his closet and putting on his uniform and like pretending to be him because I love my dad. And you fast forward to when I'm 17, I remember he asked me, or actually he's telling me that he had to go pick up a prisoner in Louisiana. Yeah, we bonded over a prisoner. Anyways, uh, he asked me, or he told me this, and I said, Dad, I'll go with you. He had to drive all the way in there all night and drive back. And so I'm like, Dad, can I wear a uniform? <laughs> and he's like, no. I'll give you a polo. Done. <laughs> and so I put that polo on. It has sheriff's department on there. Tucked it in, jeans, boots, put my straw hat, just like the deputies. Walked in that room. Oh, yeah. Feeling good about myself. Right? Got in that car, a police car, drove all the way there, picked him up on the way back. I noticed, Dad's getting tired. Dad, you want me to drive? And he was so tired. He's like, yeah, I guess so. He pulled over. Opportunity. Right? <laughs> he falls asleep. I book it. 100 plus miles an hour. Who's going to stop me? I'm in a police car. Come on, opportunity knocks. It was incredible. But it's funny how we do that with the people that we love. We love to mimic them. We, we want to be them. I always wanted to be my dad. I always wanted to be his, in his shoes. It's no different than Jesus. An opportunity to love and connect with others is an opportunity to stand in his place, to be in his shoes to be the presence of God. And through that, through this togetherness, it also produces change. You can't help but be changed by God's love and God's people. I could go around this room and tell you testimony after testimony of people who have such peace because of God or how drastically God changed their lives and their families through togetherness. That God got a hold of their lives and put the right people in there and it just drastically changed who they are. And have you ever noticed, like, reading through Scripture over and over and over, everyone who came in direct, intimate contact with Jesus changed permanently? Amen. It wasn't they said a prayer, and then they were off to the same stuff they were in before. They drastically changed them, right? And I know our, our journey, it's, it's up and down. But when Jesus physically approached people, when he healed people, when he loved people, the, late, the, you know, the woman at the well, she, she went and told everybody and changed the whole city. Every time he came in direct contact with somebody, it changed him. Over and over. And I mean, his birth changed the world so much, so much, that the Roman calendar system retroactively adjusted the calendar so that Jesus' birth would be marked as the start of a new era. Come on, come on. We, every day, whether you believe him or not, you are honoring him by simply writing the date down pretty incredible. There's power in togetherness. So we talked about Jesus's prayer. Here's Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3, 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep the love of Christ is. And to know that his love, this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to, to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us to him be glory in the church in Christ Jesus throughout all generation forever and ever. Can I encourage you this Christmas to focus on being together? Together with Christ and together with one another, not just in the same room, but establishing a bond with people that is eternal. Look, just because you're in the same room with somebody doesn't mean you're together. Right? We have to be devoted to one another. We can accomplish more together than we can alone. Together, ordinary people can achieve extra, extraordinary results. Just how you can head on up. I want to take a moment, just a brief moment real quick. I got a, something else I want to share after this. But as I talk about togetherness, I can't not help but think about all those people who may be sitting in this room who've lost somebody. So I... 
if that's you, I just Lord put this on me, and I went back and forth, and whether I wanted to do this or not, but Lord kept saying, you need to, because we have to minister to all people. And there's people in this room that are heartbroken because when we talk about togetherness, all you can think about are the people have gone. Maybe this year, maybe the last couple of years, I know me and my wife, this is very personal for us because two years ago, we both lost our moms within six months apart. And then when we approach Christmas, it gets a little bit hard. It's hard sometimes, right? And I know there's people in here that lost people this week. So I simply want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. I want you to know, I want you to know that God's light may go dim at times in our lives. However, God reminds us that he is the light that will never go out. And I want to pray for you. Could you, could you, let's just bow our heads. If I'm speaking to you, could you just raise your hand? If, if you lost somebody this year, okay, hands all over the room. I just want to pray for you. Father God, Lord, you did come to, to reunite us with you and to unite us with one another. And sometimes that bond seems to be broken through death. Lord, help reassure us that bond will never be broken. Even though people may not physically be in front of us, Lord, there is eternity waiting for us. But I pray for these people who are heartbroken right now, who have to approach Christmas and a constant reminder that they're not there. Lord, help us build everything around this grief, like pastors mentioned before, much bigger than the grief, so the grief gets smaller. Lord, help us focus on those that are here, all the things that we do have, shift our perspective so that we can have joy this season. Lord, help these people who, are, who have raised their hand, help them know that they have people all around them in this church who truly love them, who truly desire the best for them and will be there no matter what. Lord, we have family and unity because of what you've done. Because you sent your son to this earth, we now can have true community. Thank you for that, Father. And I just pray for these people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Just the rest of the room, I want you to think about these things here. Togetherness is about heart, not habit. Togetherness is about love, not location. Togetherness is about vulnerability, not just visual presence. Togetherness is about forgiveness, not impressions. Ultimately, togetherness moves God. So there was this nobleman, and I'll end here. But there was this nobleman back in the day. He lived in a small village. This was long before electricity. He said, how, how can I make a difference in this world? I mean, he was, he was a little bit older, so he started thinking a little more about what legacy am I leaving? What am I doing? Well, I, I'm just spinning my wheels, not doing anything. How am I making a difference? So he began to pray about it, and he, he felt led to build a large community building within the community that all this community can go to, which eventually became a church. So all these people, so he built this thing, it's beautiful, but it had no windows. And so what he did, as people were walking in for the first time, he gave them a small lantern. And they all began to walk in into this very dark room with their lanterns. And with everybody having lanterns all the room, the room just lit up. And it was beautiful and it was bright. And it brought purpose into the room, right? Without the people, and without the light, there was no purpose for the building. Can I tell you something, church? You are valuable to us. You are valuable to this place. You are valuable to the kingdom of God. Not just some of you, all of you. If you have air in your lungs, you are valuable to the kingdom of God. And the thing about that building with all those lanterns, when a few people decide not to show up, it changed the environment a little bit. And so when you don't show up, and this is not a guilt trip in any way, because I think sometimes... When, especially when pastors, we go out and we run into somebody we haven't seen in a while. They instantly think we're judging them and that we're guilty. We just genuinely love you and we want to be with you. And I want you to know, and I'm not trying to twist your arm when you don't show up. We miss you because you add value to the kingdom. You bring a light that nobody else can bring. 
right? When he died on the cross, when he came to this earth, he had each one of you in his mind because he wanted to be connected with you because he knew how much of value is in you. You have value. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of Little Country Church. Thank you for completing our family. And don't let that light stop. It's your opportunity and privilege to continue to share it. Let's just pray one more time. Father God, I just thank you for your word. Thank you for bringing value in our life. Thank you for giving us worth, Lord. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to be together and understand what love is. Lord, I know we get wrapped up on all the, the craziness of the season, but Lord, help us remember that it's all so that we can be connected with you and be connected with one another. You're such a good father. You're such a good father. We love you so much. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you give God praise this morning?